Now, I feel very proud to introduce the speaker, respected Brahma Kumar Balakishore. I can guarantee that he, he will definitely enrich yourself with many more pines. He has been in the IT industry for the past 21 years and is currently working as Vice President Transformation at Sears Software, a cloud and analytic business transformation company. While Balabai has been busy doing many things as a part of his work, he is also very interested in the being part as an experienced meditation practitioner Balavai has done his M.Tech in computer science. He has been practicing Raj Yoga meditation as taught by Brahma Kumaris since 1993. He is also a part of the Spark core group. Balavai, please present your views and experience in front of the audience. Hello, Om Shanti and good morning. So can you smile a bit? Yeah, that's good. Let's start the day with a nice smile. Yeah? So what do I have in store for you for the next 40 or 45 minutes? What I would like to impress upon you is that human body is biologically endowed with all the necessary infrastructure to help us grow mentally and spiritually. And what is science saying how we can harness the power of our mind and in the process how we can even biologically change the structure of our brain which just until 30 years ago was thought immutable or unchangeable. That is what we will review the evidence. Okay? So I'll talk about human brain's two unique properties called neuroplasticity and neurogenesis, which have been discovered only in the last 25 to 30 years. Because before that, scientists thought that brain structure or function cannot be changed. Once you're born and you grow to a certain extent, after a few years, change inside the brain stops, is what they thought. But now we know how brain keeps changing all through the life, and that is what we will explore. And then, in little more detail, through specific case studies, I'm going to share how our mind can change our brain. I'm going to talk about obsessive compulsive disorder, how our emotions impact the health, and what is the new science of epigenetics telling us are genes the destiny, or can we influence our genes with our lifestyle? That's what we will explore, and of course, uh, my favorite topic on meditation. How meditation helps the mind change the brain. Are you ready? Okay, good. So, plasticity comes from the Greek word plastikos. What it means is, to form or to mold. That is, you can change the brain. So now, what science is talking about, the latest research in the field of neuroscience, is that brain does change, and brain's structure can be changed. And it is an inherent property of the brain to change. And that inherent characteristic of the brain is what we call as neuroplasticity. It is the brain's ability to change. Why does it change? In response to the changes in the environment and the activities performed. What we think, what we say, what we do has the capacity to change our brain. And from the time you walked into Mount Abu a couple of days ago and what you are going through, and as you listen to each of these sessions, it is actually changing your brain. How does that happen? We will explore. Now, what is the power of this particular characteristic or capability of brain? Let's watch that 
with a simple small video clip. This is about a small six-year-old kid who, when she was three years old, she was getting a lot of epileptic seizures. That is, she was not able to control one half of our body. In our terms, we call them as fits. Continuously, she used to get those. And the doctors decided the only way that these seizures can stop is by removing half the brain. And they did that surgery. What happened after that, we will see that in the video. We are beginning to harness the brain's incredible ability to invent itself, then reinvent itself throughout life. This girl is a testament to the amazing resilience of the human brain. Young Jody Miller leads an idyllic life as a nine-year-old girl. You would never guess that she has undergone some of the most drastic surgery imaginable. Jody's first three years were textbook normal. Then, about six weeks after her third birthday, a storm of epileptic seizures took control of her brain. She couldn't use her left arm hardly at all. Uh, she could barely use the left leg, seizing a good, good deal of the time, multiple types of seizures. Ordinary life became impossible. Medicines did nothing and the seizures threatened to turn fatal. Desperate, Jody's parents brought her to pediatric neurologist Eileen Vining. We found her seizures were all, all coming from her right hemisphere. And we knew that there is virtually nothing else, nothing but Rasmussen syndrome that can produce that picture uh, in a young child. Rasmussen syndrome is a degenerative brain disorder that disrupts the electrical activity that makes our brains work. Tiny electrical explosions were flaring up in Jody's right hemisphere. As seizures became almost constant, she lost control of her left side. Only one radical treatment option remained. We knew that she was never going to have her seizures controlled with medicine, and we knew that she and her family faced taking out that half of the brain. Okay. Dr. Vining recommended a daring surgery called a hemispherectomy. It would be performed by pediatric neurosurgeon Ben Carson. The whole concept of taking out half of a person's brain uh, would seem to, to most people impossible. Human beings are incredible creatures with a brain that is beyond belief in terms of its capabilities. To the point where we can take half of it out and still function in a normal way. 85% of our brain consists of the cerebral cortex, which is divided into two hemispheres, each with four main lobes. The cortex handles many of our higher functions. Areas on both sides control thinking, movement, and sensation. But the right side controls our left side, and vice versa. Jody would lose almost all of her right hemisphere, and the cavity would fill with cerebrospinal fluid. The operation has to be performed with great precision to avoid damaging the parts of the brain that control Jody's life functions, like heartbeat and breathing. The surgery went flawlessly. What we're looking at here is an image, an MRI, that was done on Jody after her surgery. And what it shows us is the fact that we in removed her entire right hemisphere. And what we're able to see here is indeed her very normal left hemisphere and all the beautiful gyri of her cortex. And we can see right down the middle, the right hemisphere that was there is now replaced by fluid. But how could Jody function normally with only one hemisphere? It's because of a miraculous ability of the brain called plasticity. Our brains can actually change shape, creating new connections between neurons or brain cells to replace lost or damaged ones. Jody's left brain started reconnecting almost immediately. 
this young lady had half her brain removed, went home, I guess maybe 10 days later, and was already walking. She was ambulating. She was able to walk out of the hospital. And that's because her left hemisphere had such resilience, such plasticity. It was able to say, okay, something needs to move her left leg. Whoa. You gonna open it? Okay. Jody continues to work on training her brain to overcome the slight paralysis in her left side. But enough. Now that's very good. You need to do that stretching stuff, honey. You know that, don't you? Are you doing enough of it? I think so. <laughs> The human brain is just an awesome thing because every time I look at it, I say to myself, this is the thing that makes this person unique. It still is just such a wonderful thing to find a young person whose life now can move on, who's no longer having seizures, who's developing in a normal fashion. I take the good with the bad and I say, this is a that thing potentially that we have to do for an extremely good cause. One interesting thing about brain and body is left half of our brain controls the right side of our body and the right half of our brain controls the left side of the body. So when her right hemisphere was removed, effectively, the left side of the body became paralyzed. But the signals were still being sent, and brain changed itself in such a way that the left side of the brain that was still there started handling signals both from right side as well as left side. That is the capability of neuroplasticity. That's the capability of the brain. And that characteristic is what we call as neuroplasticity. Now, why are we learning about this? Why should we learn about this particular property? It is because we, by focusing and paying attention, we can also change the brain in positive ways. That is what is called as self-directed neuroplasticity. What it means is using the power of focused attention along with the ability to apply commitment, hard work and dedication, that's the key, to direct your choices and actions, thereby rewiring your brain to work for you and with your true self. If you pay attention, if you have commitment, if you are ready to do hard work and you are dedicated, you can change your brain. Now sit back. What did our parents tell us? What did our grandma or grandpa or our seniors tell us in our culture? You pay attention, committed to a task, work hard, and be dedicated, you can achieve what you want. And now neuroscience is coming around and saying, if you have these four, you can even physically change the brain. That's what I meant when I said, human body is biologically endowed with all the necessary infrastructure to help us grow, both mentally and spiritually. And this is something that is in our hands. When you pay attention and when you train, attention and training can change which genes get turned on and which genes get turned off. Another fascinating thing which we will explore in the next few minutes. The interesting part about the self-directed neuroplasticity is this, focused attention. Now let's do a simple exercise. Are you able to hear the humming sound? Are you able to hear that? Now, you've been here for the last 20 minutes or 25 minutes. It was always there. But only now when you paid attention, you were able to 
register that sound and experience it. Unless brain processes the sensory inputs, we won't feel it, we won't experience it. And what makes the brain process it is what we pay attention to. That is, attention. If brain is the filter, then attention is the gate. What we pay attention to and how we pay attention determines the content and quality of life. One of the most important things that we learn here at Brahma Kumaris. How we feel, what we feel, more than 95% of the time is in my hands. It depends on what I am paying attention to. Sitting here, if you pay attention to what we are discussing, you will learn. But sitting here, if you pay attention to your WhatsApp, or to your email, or to your mobile, you will lose an opportunity. So what you pay attention to and how you pay attention determines the content and quality of life. Wherever my attention goes, energy flows, yes? And wherever my energy flows, that is where life grows, whether it is positive or negative. It depends on how you choose to direct your attention. If you pay attention to all things negative in your life, that's what you will experience. If you pay attention to all things positive in your life, that's what you will experience. That is the self-directed capability that we have in our hands. And the next property which is equally important is neurogenesis. Until recently, until late 90s, it was thought that once you are born and the brain has a certain capacity of neurons, no more neurons are born, there is only one way, that is downhill, you will continue to lose neurons all through the life. But now, that reasoning has been overturned. Now we know every single day, brain generates new neurons. Fascinating stuff. It creates 10,000 new stem cells. That is, from each stem cell, two daughter cells are formed. One becomes the stem cell for generating more neurons next day, and the other one becomes the neuron. And what happens to these new neurons? They become into two, as I said, and very often, these new cells migrate to the areas of new learning. If you are engaged in very interesting activity day after day, brain provides the necessary infrastructure for you to continue to progress in your learning by helping integrate these new neurons into those new circuits that you are currently engaged in. But if you don't use them, and if you think that I am too old, enough is enough. And too old nowadays can also be as young as 21 years. Okay? So I just passed my college, now no longer exams, my study is finished. No. If you are that kind, then these new cells are simply going to die because they are not being put to good use. And these new 10,000 neurons that brain has generated over the next four months, they start making new connections with other neurons, provided you utilize them in the new learning. So constantly brain is creating the necessary infrastructure to help us learn and grow. How can mind change your brain? So these are the two fundamental properties. What are they? Neuroplasticity and neurogenesis. How can our mind utilize these two properties to change our brain? That's where this aspect of attention comes. That's hence the title of this session, Train Your Mind, Change Your Brain. Now let's explore this through a few examples. Mind through brain impacts the body. There is another arrow also that is not visible because we are not going to discuss about that. 
What we are going to discuss today is this sequence, how mind can impact the brain and through brain impact the body. Let's see the first example. It's called as obsessive compulsive disorder. What it means is sometimes in some people you must have seen they have this urge to continuously wash their hands because they are scared of getting infected with germs. Or some of them, they continuously keep checking. They lock the door, they go to their car, and then come back and then they keep checking that. They keep repeating those activities. Or some of them who keep changing their room and they keep cleaning the same thing over and over again. Excessive thoughts accompanied by repetitive actions is what characterizes obsessive compulsive disorder. And that happens because of misfiring of what we call as error detection circuit. It's called as orbital cortex. When it misfires inside the brain, every single time you feel that something is wrong and you have to perform this activity to correct that wrong. That wrong can be your thought that you might get infected with these germs or you forgot to lock the door, or the things are not organized. There are many such things that happen to the people who are afflicted by this disorder. Until 90s, there was no known cure for this disorder. And all through their life, poor folks, they were going through with these urges and it made their life terrible. Then there came in Jeffrey Schwartz in early 90s, scientist from USA, what he wanted to do was, can, he simply questioned, can I help people to recategorize these obsessions or thoughts that they are getting such that they can separate themselves from the thought they are getting and not perform their action? Then he came up with a very simple treatment. He said, he started teaching the patients to relabel their urge whatever my fear or anxiety is arising because of the excessive thinking, he taught them to label it as they are not real. And taught them to reattribute these feelings are coming from my faulty OCD circuit, not from me. It is the faulty circuit inside my brain that is switching on and off constantly, which is making generate these thoughts, reattribute, refocus go and do something else other than your urge. Revalue. Obsessions are worthless distractions to be ignored. And when they started practicing this, they were not taking any meditation, uh, any medication. They were just practicing these four steps. Relabel their anxiety, reattribute the cause, refocus on something else and revalue. Within 10 weeks, the error circuit that was going on and off and creating these obsessive thoughts, it started calming down. And they were able to see the difference in their life. That was the first time in the world when by just changing the thinking, the functionality of the brain was changed. With 10 weeks of meditation practice, which involved these four steps, brain changed biologically. No medication just with focused attention following these four steps. That was one of the first classic proof that mind can influence brain. There are many. Now let me share something which is closer home, how our emotions impact our health. We have two kinds of emotions, positive and negative. And when you have these positive emotions, brain creates positive chemicals called positive neuropeptides. When you make negative emotions, it creates negative neuropeptides. And these result, and these are what we call them as endorphins or steroids and distress hormones, adrenaline. And these positive neuropeptides, they release healing energy. And these negative stress hormones, they release harmful energy. And in this case, the result is health. And in this case, the result is disease. So how your mind through your brain is impacting your body. Now let's see this in a little more detail of in terms of stress which we are all familiar with. When you perceive 
any threat in the environment, that threat once you perceive is felt by hypothalamus, which in turn signals pituitary gland, which in turn signals the adrenaline glands to secrete stress hormones. That's where adrenaline and cortisol are secreted into the blood. And then suddenly you have this urge either to fight or to move away, what we call as fight or flight response. And it, these stress hormones prepare your body. So what you felt in your mind through the brain started impacting the body. And if this stress is not handled, I won't go into the details, you already know most of the negative impacts. Now, if this is what is caused by negative emotions, there's something more interesting with respect to the positive emotions. When you are compassionate, okay, when you have that rahim, that daya, both on yourself and on others, that compassion has been found to strengthen the vagal tone. Vagal tone means that is the strength of the vagal nerve that goes from behind your neck and it passes through many of the internal organs. It also passes through heart. What has been found is when you practice meditation, when you practice compassion, that compassion increases the strength of this vagal nerve, it improves the vagal tone, and thus improves your heart health. So when we talk about Badi Dil and Choti Dil, they are indeed true. Okay, if you have a Choti Dil, that's not good for your own heart. But in opposite, if you have a body dill, that's actually contributing for your cardiovascular health. And that mediator is through the vagal nerve. Forgiveness and reduction in stress levels. When we forgive ourselves and when we forgive others, we don't have to forget, but just forgive, then that has been found to reduce a lot of our stress levels. Shall we do that now? Yeah, sit back, close your eyes. Think of someone or something that you haven't forgiven so far. Bring them in front of you with lots of love, with lots of love and compassion. Forgive them. And if you don't have anybody, for any mistake that you have committed recently, forgive yourself. Gently open your eyes. How do you feel? Forgiveness is not about the other person. It's about me. When I carry those negative thoughts, when I carry that dislike for somebody inside me, it is practically changing my state of mind and my brain and my body. It is bad for me. Forget about the other person. That's why it's very important that we start being compassionate to ourselves and start forgiving ourselves. That's why here it said, apne aap par rahem karna seekho, which is very, very important if we want to be mentally and physically healthy. Another interesting part, charity. We learned as kids, neki kar, yeah. So what this research shows is if anyone performs even one act of charity per week, just one act of charity per week, that act has the capacity to improve the immune system. Charity means, what is the meaning of charity? Doing something good to someone else who is not related to you without expecting anything in return. That last part is the key. Only then it is charity. 
Otherwise, it becomes expectation. I'm taking her kid to the school because her husband is not there. Let me see if she's going to take my kid when my husband is not there. <laughs> that is not charity. Okay? So there is a meaning when we said neki kar darya me dal means you perform the good act and then you don't expect anything in return. Only then your body seems to understand the purity of your intention and respond accordingly. Beautiful. So when you are doing something good to somebody else, whom are you doing it for? You're doing it for yourself. And that other person is becoming a reason for you to good to yourself. That's charity. And when you do that, your own immune system strengthens. Gratitude makes you happier and healthier. Now, this is something I would like to suggest to each one of you from today. Will you do? Yeah. Let's do that exercise now. Can you close your eyes? And thank yourself for three things that you have in your life that you are happy about. You can thank God, you can thank your parents, you can thank your teachers, or even thank yourself. Three things you are grateful for that you have in your life. Feel those that you have and genuinely be grateful for. Dil se shukriya da karo. Very good. Open your eyes. If you can do this exercise every day before you sleep and maintain a gratitude journal, just write three things for which you are thankful for, which have happened all through the day. Recall those before you sleep, write them down. Have a separate book. It's called as gratitude journal and see what happens to your mental state and also to the quality of your sleep and health in general. And there are quite a few organizations. If any one of you is interested, I'm going to share my email at the end of this presentation. I'll share a lot of material. I'm not giving, boring you with a lot of uh, references because I would like to share those with interested people. And thoughts can change your brain. Let me show you another small clip. Time. And so the challenge is to learn enough about it so that you can guide the changes. So you saw that. In the two groups, one group was asked to actually play the piano, which changed those changes of areas of brain corresponding to the finger movement, and the other group was asked just to think. When they sat and thought, of course, with attention, brain changed the way the people who were actually playing the piano, their brains changed. Similarly, those people who thought, even their brains changed without performing any activity. And that's what he's saying. Be careful what you think, because whatever you think is actually changing your brain. And what is meditation? So it's about coming to a new perception of reality and nature of mind, and about nurturing new qualities until they become integral parts of our being. That's you learn a new way of doing things, and then you practice it such that it becomes a part of you. And meditation is a form of attention training. Very important. Just by focusing your thoughts on something positive about yourself, you start physically changing the brain. And when we start meditating, there are different parts of the brain, what scientists have observed, which give rise to different activities just by when you meditate for a, when you start meditating for a few weeks even if it is just for a few minutes per day you improve your concentration because there is the activity inside thalamus that go down you start feeling relaxed because the activity in cortex goes down 
you start feeling more relaxed and less anxious because there's another area of the brain, what we call as the centry of the brain, reticular formation, where the activity comes down. So there are many such benefits that occur through meditation. And some of those are given here. There are behavioral benefits, which talk about you becoming more compassionate, emotional benefit, which helps you reduce anxiety, health benefits, which help you to reduce your chronic pain, and also eating disorders, and cognitive benefits, which help you improve your focus. So there are many benefits that we get by learning to focus on something positive as a part of meditation. So what is the summary of what we discussed so far? You create the brain from the input you give. It's not growing on its own. You are actively participating. Brain can be trained to rewire itself to re respond with compassion and altruism. As you saw, neuroplasticity is a value-neutral characteristic. That is, if you give something positive, brain responds positively. You give something negative, brain responds negatively. So neuroplasticity plus attention plus experience, that is what we call as brain change. And each of our brains, with willful, mindful effort, we can alter the brain structure and function. You saw that in multiple examples just now. But the key is willful and mindful effort. Your brain is a tatastu machine. You think positive, it says tatastu. You think negative, it says tatastu. Because that's what brain's property is. It does not understand what is positive, what is negative. It just responds. So remember that next time you get angry, next time you get anxious, next time you get jealous, who is saying tatastu? My own brain is saying tatastu. And that's the key. Why all this conversation about science, brain, orbital cortex, this and that? Because most of us, we want scientific proof before we sit and then spend a few minutes in meditation. So that's the proof that I presented. And remember, you are the master of your mind. You can train your mind and you can change your brain. Provided? 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 Very good, provided you want to change it. If you are one of those who says, I am like this only, what does brain say? And if you are one of those who says, no, I can grow, I want to improve my potential, what does your brain say? So from today onwards, think less, think slow, think better, and of course, meditate daily.